Hopefully you'll get a new take on some of this. Um, there are a number of different products in Australia. In fact, um, a, a colleague of ours in South Australia decided that she'd do a little mini trial on her own. She was a hematologist and she decided to go into 15 different pharmacies, um, druggists with her, sorry, the American and the Australian language crossover frequently, um, go into different druggists and tell them that she was a mother who was told by her clinician that she was needing to go on oral iron and started asking, what product should I go on? And her outcome of this little mini trial was rather frightening as to what she was told and what uh, was available on the shelf. So we can always use a refresher on this information and that's what we're doing today. So why do we care about this? Well, we care about our patients. We care about their quality of life, instructions that we need to give them in how to appropriately use and treat different conditions and our, their outcomes are far the most important thing to all of us. So from a community perspective, here are all the different areas that iron deficiency has influence on. Some of these things we forget about from time to time, premature births, learning disabilities, attention deficits, fatigue levels, concentration, chronic health disorders, and the inappropriate allocation of blood products. Uh, we do have a shortage. We've had a shortage for since we started transfusing patients and therefore are we appropriately treating our patients so that they don't have to get to the point where they're in crisis and in an ED someplace. Another area like we talked about this morning that is new to the uh, arena is the cardiovascular consequences of iron deficiency. 31% of ESRD patients in a study of 433 patients had cardiac failure as a leading cause of death. Now with ESRD we of course have iron deficiency it's referred to as the cardiorenal syndrome that we talked about this morning in the physiology of iron, and therefore this cycle needs to be broken. And the only way sometimes you have any play in breaking that cycle of <coughs> cardiorenal syndrome is by treating them with iron appropriately. There's 74% um, cases of iron deficiency in left ventricular hypertrophy. Independent, it is an independent predictor of CHF mortality as Michael mentioned, and it increases the risk of angina, myocardial infarction, and transient ischemic events. So we talked about the typicals, poor quality of life, fatigue, dizziness, increased mortality, and increased hospital stays. And again, look at the age on these pieces of literature. This is not a new issue. This has been around for a very long time, and it's been published for a very long time. Michael used different phrases this morning when we're talking about the different causes of iron deficiency. Um, the ones that I wanted to specifically bring up was the erythropoietic interference, namely ACE inhibitors and ARBs about 15 years, less than 15 years ago, about 10 years ago. These became typical treatment in the cardiac failure population. Great drugs, wonderful results, but at the same time it blunts the erythropoietic cycle. Therefore, um, on some papers, they say that a year to a year and a half after you're on a combination of these two drugs, your hemoglobin drops by 10. Your iron deficiency increases, and so this is a whole cycle. But we're treating one thing one way, but there's always a repercussion around the circle another way. So we need to keep those things in mind. Also, those patients that are on long-term NSAIDs, ASA, anticoagulation, especially the cardiac population, and pre-existing disorders. We already know about malabsorption, but we forget about the gastric weight loss patients, the ones that have a surgical intervention, not the banding, not the sleeves, but we're talking about the surgical intervention. These people are chronically iron deficient and B12 deficient for the rest of their lives. They usually require IV iron, a minimum of once a year, in order to maintain their quality of life. So what are the symptoms? These are the typicals that we all know about. These are the typical patients that we know about. But what about the little recognized symptoms? When your patient comes in and starts complaining about depression, is iron deficiency one of the things that come to mind? Many people have a hard time getting their description around their fatigue versus depression. And sometimes good old fashioned iron screening will help you with that step and trying to rule out that this isn't one of the simple causes 
I've uh, run into this many times where patients say, I'm just so depressed, when in actuality, they're iron deficient and becoming anemic. Sleep apnea, another section we forget about. These people are commonly iron deficient. Restless leg syndrome. We went through a phase in the United States a few years ago when these drugs went on the market and they were marketed big time as far as treating restless leg syndrome and physicians forgot to look at something as simple as iron deficiency. Uh, cognition disturbances. Um, I'm just getting older, I'm stressed. I'm not having, I'm having a hard time grasping what's going on at work and how to problem solve, et cetera. Some of these can be early signs of iron deficiency. GFRs, I've had patients, and I know Michael has as well, where you're working them up for cardiac surgery and you see their GFR uh, dropping rapidly. You give them IV iron and they pop back up to at least another level at an improved renal insufficiency. So that's also something that you'll see on your panels is a GFR that's slowly climbing. Thermoregulation we all can relate to. And there have been some literature in uh, toddlers and in early stages of development of children that were um, born to mothers that were very <coughs> iron deficient and anemic. Um, so there's early signs of this issue as well. And in small children of malnutrition, et cetera, <laughs> This also contributes. What about the frequent blood donor? We forget about these people. They are only screened for hemoglobins. They are not screened for iron. So therefore, their iron tank is almost empty by the time their hemoglobin drifts off, and then they're turned away at the, um, at the blood service. So therefore, we need to keep them in mind in our regular screening of our patients as your regular workups. Are you a blood donor? How often do you donate? Are you taking any supplements to, you know, to supply you so that you can be a rotational donor if that's what you choose to be? People who take acid-reducing medications, we're going to talk about that in a few seconds. This is a huge issue, uh, especially now that they're over the counter. Elderly, especially those who eat poorly, those who are indigent or live alone are the biggest culprits. They eat a very poor diet on a daily basis, and in time that catches up with them. We talked about previous gastric, surgical, and all these inflammatory disorders. These patients are all iron deficient at one point or another during their course of treatment. What does the blood work look like? Well, that's, we talked a little bit about it this morning. When are they inflamed? When are they not inflamed? At what level the ferritin is reliable? At what level it isn't reliable? It gets very confusing, and therefore your best bet is to get the entire panel at one time. Your fourth rule will jump down there first only because it is the only time that you can rely on a full set of iron indices as if it reads low, they are truly low. But it isn't just casual low, it's usually desperately low. So keep that in mind. Normal to high could mean anything depending upon the patient's history. So therefore you have to look at the whole picture before you can decide whether it truly is normal or it is truly high. Second rule, serum iron, something that a lot of people forget about. Serum iron, your transfer and saturation that Michael emphasized last talk, is a math calculation of the transferrin and the serum iron. Transferrin is not, a, is not influenced by oral intake. Serum iron is. Therefore, if you want a one-shot deal on checking your blood work for your patient so they don't have to come back in the office because of a technicality or that you don't trust a certain level, the patient should be fasting before that draw. Serum iron is directly influenced by oral intake. Therefore, if they're on any vitamins or oral iron supplements, they need to be off those supplements for 24 to 48 hours prior to that draw because it can influence their serum iron up uh, artificially, or not artificially, but you understand what I'm talking about. And the transferrin is going to stay the same, but when it's calculated between the serum iron and the transferrin, if you've got an artificially elevated serum iron, of course that iron saturation is not going to be as accurate. Therefore, we usually say eight hours without food, 24 hours without supplements that may have iron in them before that next lab draw to see how they're doing on a panel. Maybe you put them on it for the last two months and you want to see how they're doing. That would be wise to do that. 
Okay, third rule, the only high level that you should consider probably accurate is the transferrin, which a high transferrin equals iron deficiency. So what does that panel look like? Your typical panel in your office is going to be the area above the red line. And if it's a preoperative setting, our standard request from hospitals, I mean from GPs, is to include those at the bottom of the list. Okay. Now this is only if, uh, if they're going for cataract surgery or things like that, of course you don't need to get this involved. But you do if it's on one of those procedures we talked about this morning where there's a measurable blood loss potential involved. So when it comes to the iron indices, this is all the ways that it can be influenced, which you have in your hands, and so I'm not going to go through them one at a time. But you can see why it's better just to get the entire panel so that you can rule out the different phases of each one of these. MCH is a pretty reliable level out of all of these. Uh, transferrin saturation, if you've gotten a fasting serum iron along with that, as well as the MCH can usually be fairly reliable. We usually look at an MCH below 28 as being iron deficiency. So how do we treat it once we see it? Do you give oral? Do you not give oral? Again, this is the history that you would want to engage in with your patient that are pertinent to iron and how to treat them accordingly. Each one of these, you probably already know about your patient, but if you're brand new to this patient, these would be the things that you'd want to know about. The alcohol use, again, we have to think about because if you're giving IV iron, you're going to be either adjusting down your dosage or if they're an acute liver crisis of any kind, you're not necessarily going to choose this route. You just have to use some serious caution when it comes to these patients. But if you've already gotten your liver en enzymes evaluated, then you already know if they're already in acute uh, liver failure. Present prescription medications. We'll talk about conflicting oral agents that are out there. Nutritional supplements that they're on. Some of them think they're taking a great dose of iron. And if you look at the container of what they're taking, it usually has next to nothing in it regarding iron supplementation. Environmental or medication in, in, uh, allergies, that would be part of your screening. If you're thinking IV iron, some of these people are at higher risk for allergic reaction than others. GI history, obviously you're already going to consider this. Are they having active blood loss? Have they been scoped recently? Daily diet, daily activity. Previous surgeries they've had, always important to know whether they've had any gastric intervention or not. And previous medical diagnosis, all the obvious that you're already well aware of. This is a culprit that's been around for over 20 years, but it's only been over the, mar over the counter for a while, and that's the H2 blockers and the PPIs. These are wonderful drugs. They have basically wiped out esophageal cancers to the level that they used to be diagnosed. They are great. Patients love them. They're much more comfortable with acid reflux, but they do come with a drawback. H2s, if the patient is taking them once a day on their own without a prescription, meaning they're just taking it from over the counter because it makes them feel better, their absorption could still probably take oral iron if you waited until uh, maybe two hours before their next pill that they're going to take but their pH is never going to return within 24 hours on a PPI to the level that it needs to be in order to absorb oral iron. Therefore, we're talking about the fact that not only are they going to block that oral iron pill by taking these agents, but they're also going to block all the iron they're eating every day. Therefore, usually within one to two years, if a patient is taking these drugs every day, they are becoming iron deficient and or are iron deficient and eventually anemic. So therefore, these drugs so commonly given in the hospital and in the outpatient setting and over the counter by different patients that buy them on their own do come with a drawback. This also pertains to B12 as well. So especially in the PPIs, it never returns in 24 hours from the last dose down to a pH that it can absorb the iron and the B12. What kind of iron? Unfortunately, we don't have an oral heme 
iron pill available that I'm aware of that I've been able to find in Australia. In the United States, it's even hard to find. Uh, Canada, it's hard to find. But these are also taken from bovine hemoglobin, these agents that are produced and very hard to get your hands on. The point is, the reason why I bring it up is these are the only irons that are available that don't require, the acid does not ref, ref, restrict the absorption at all. All the other irons that we're used to prescribing for our patients and seeing over the counter are acid dependent. You have to have a low enough acid in order to absorb. So what's the problem with oral iron? It's very cheap. Why is it such a problem? Well, people don't like taking them. If you've ever taken oral iron, you can understand why. About 80% of patients that take it really hate taking it and or don't take it accurately. They're told a number of different things from different clinicians and friends. Take it when you're eating food. Take the liquid. Take it here. Take it there. Take it with uh, orange juice. Take it with all kinds of things. They get all kinds of advice. The problem being is that the best way it's going to work is number one, they don't have an, an inflammatory course going on in their system, as Michael mentioned to you about the hepcidin issue, and they take it in between meals, and they take the appropriate product. If you're iron deficient, it takes a minimum of 100 milligrams of elemental oral iron in order to make an impact on your iron deficiency, and therefore you have to be taking the right product and there's a lot of different bottles on the counter in the druggist area that talks about this is an iron product and they all have different measurements. It has to be elemental, which is usually very hard to find on the print. You have to pull out the little magnifying glass and read through every single teeny little word to find the measurement of elemental iron. So 100 or 300 milligrams a day oral intake if they are iron deficient. So that means a minimum of about two doses a day. So in between an hour and a half on either side of a meal or prior to a meal. And therefore you get the gastric burn, you get all kinds of symptoms, unfortunately. There's a school of thought that the sustained release uh, doesn't work efficiently into the area of the gut that it needs to, but I've never seen anything in print that says that it doesn't work. It's just a school of thought. Another thing is that many times patients will take their oral iron, they do it very regimentally and they do well. They go back to their GP for a workup, they see a hemoglobin that's come up to normal and they say, okay, you can quit taking it now. What happens is the, what you've been taking in that has been absorbing, you're making the RBCs that bring you back into a normal range, but you're not filling up the tank for at least three to six months. So stopping that oral iron just because the hemoglobin comes up has not resolved the iron deficiency. It's only resolved the anemia. So keep that in mind as you're clocking out how much longer it takes before you can tell your patient to stop taking it. So it's not recommended for patients taking acid reducing medication over the counter. A trial of six weeks is usually the minimum that we recommend instead of saying we'll just take it for two weeks and we'll look at your numbers. Actually, it needs to be about six weeks before you can really get a feel for whether it's making an impact on your patient or not. And for the full package for RBCs and for restoring the stores, it's three to six months. So empty stomach in between meals an hour and a half before or after. Do not take at the same time as any other medications. Do not take any acid reducing agents around the time even the chewables can block so I've had some patients that are just as anemic and iron deficient from chewables because they take them so many times during the day than patients that are taking prescribed medication. Take with water, no tea, coffee, or calcium enriched liquids. Advise starting on stool softeners at the same time oral regime starts. Some patients wait until they become so bound up one week later that then they start taking it. It's usually easier on them if they can start taking the stool softeners. And the ones without the laxatives just stool softener. They don't need the laxative, they just need stool softener. So whatever dose it's required in order to adjust them accordingly and make them more comfortable. Some people, about two to five percent, will get really horrible gastro, uh, diarrhea, uh, within 24 hours of starting oral supplements. Uh, and it's really profound. It's, it, 
is crippling to them. They complain drastically about it. Those people are not going to absorb that oral iron. There's no point in trying to pursue it unless you want to take it off for a week, ask them to start it back up at half dose if they're willing to give it a try. If they're not, then it's just not going to work. So these are all the different intakes that can block or blunt the effect of your oral intake. And it should be inducing reticulocytosis within days if you have the ideal situation. It raised the serum hemoglobin by 10 to 20 every two weeks in the ideal situation and review at six week intervals. There's a list there in your handout regarding these different items that have higher iron intake and how much um, um, content and how much you would need to take in order to supplement the appropriate amount. So what about oral iron failure? You hear about that in the literature, especially as we approach the IV iron subject later this afternoon. Demonstrated intolerance, non-compliance, there are some patients that just can't keep that list of don't do it here, don't do it there, don't take it with this, wait this long. They just, it's just too complex for them. And those are just non-compliance is issues. Lack of efficiency with oral iron despite modification of dose timing and frequency. I do not recommend oral iron for anybody with inflammatory bowel disorders. They are crippled with this, uh, even a short-term trial. Uh, it increases the inflammatory issues that they've already got. They are just bound up and they're just miserable. So it just doesn't pay to go there. Here's the different drug interactions. You have it on your handout as well. So you have to keep that in mind as you're prescribing these as to which drugs are not recommended or they can cause influence one way or the other. Here's the most typical oral agents. And here's the price breakdown because I know with some private versus public, um, there's an issue of having to pay out of pocket for some of these. The one that we recommend the highest is the Ferrograd. Unfortunately, it's the most expensive on the list but it has a good 105 milligrams of elemental iron on each pill. And that's in your handout as well. So the different things that you need to keep in mind and or have in your information handout, and if you don't have an oral iron information handout in your clinic, I recommend you create one, especially because of all these complex instructions as to when and how to take it. Um, the different types, ferrous fumarate, sulfate, and gluconate are the best absorbed. Multivitamins have almost no iron in them when they do have iron. Liquid preparations, a lot of people swear by them, but they still don't deliver the appropriate amount of elemental iron, and you have to sip with a straw in order to prevent staining of the teeth. Sustained release, I've been a firm believer of them for years, but many different pharmacists say that that can be an issue because of where it breaks down and where it's absorbed. What about side effect issues? You need to make sure that it's mentioned in your handouts. And the favored product that we're recommending is the Ferrograd. Some feel that if you start them out on half dose, you may have more compliance. And once they've adjusted to the half dose, then they can step up to a full dose. Change to a different preparation, sometimes that makes a difference and taking it in divided doses, not all at once. There are some people that have hardcore stomachs and they say just take it at bedtime and you don't have to worry about it, but they're rare. <laughs> it's great if they can do that because then you don't have any problems with the rest of the issues around food and timing. So those are the different counseling points that you would want to include in your handouts. and. I really honestly believe that if you've counseled your patients appropriately, they're much more compliant in taking it the way that it needs to be taken. Also forewarning them about black stools. There's always this panic call that you get from somebody saying, oh my God, I must be bleeding to death because I've got these black stools. Uh, so forewarning them about that also helps. What about in pregnancy? Well, in the first trimester is really the only time during pregnancy that you can openly say if the hemoglobin is under 110, go ahead and put them on oral iron. Of course, giving them all these instructions and so forth and seeing if they are able to take it is great. If they're over 110 in the first trimester, you usually don't have to worry about it. 
By the second trimester, if they're still under 110 and they have tried um, oral iron, then you need to start thinking about IV iron course, which we'll talk about this afternoon. By the third trimester, there's no point in even trying a oral iron course because you're so late into the pregnancy that it's the oral iron is not going to make a difference, but IV iron will. So therefore, second trimester, under 110, if they have not gone on an oral iron trial, try it for six weeks. See how they do. At six weeks, check them. If they've come up, then just go ahead and keep them on the oral iron and check them again at the third trimester. So it does have its place in pregnancy. Um, it can be useful, and some women tolerate it fine. I am. Michael talked about the fact we know that in Australia there are some clinics that are still giving I am iron. It is painful. It tattoos, and the tattoo doesn't go away. Uh, therefore, um, you're only giving about 100 to 150 milligrams in each IM shot. That means for the typical adult who's iron deficient, you're giving 10 shots. It's miserable. It's horrible. So therefore, we're going to talk this afternoon about IV iron. Uh, BAML is, uh, Pradeep is going to be talking about the BAML experience, and they've had great success, and some other options that are available in the area as well. So there has been some reported of localized complications beyond tattooing. There's some vague literature regarding the fact that there's some sarcomas that have occurred from the previous injection spots, but nothing really strong in the literature that, that confirms that. What about the preoperative setting? If you've got a waiting period of three to six months, before that patient's going to surgery, and they fall into all the categories that we talked about earlier. A non-inflammatory course, they're not on the H2s or PPIs, they seem to be a compliant enough patient that they could give it a good trial, then I'd say give them a six-week trial. But if you've got a shorter period, it's not going to work. There's a range of formulations that we talked about, bioavailability considerations, that's also in the timing, and the counseling uh, points. So we'll talk about the IV range of products this afternoon and the pros and the cons to each one of them. Thank you.